The church was holding a ministry commitment, much like we are doing today. A man that was well known and wealthy was asked to give a testimony. He stood up before the congregation and said, 25 years ago, I was a runaway with only 50 cents to my name. I was sick and tired and ready to give up. Then I came into this church one Sunday for worship the pastor gave a marvelous sermon. He talked about how God wants to bless us when we dedicate everything to him. Well, I was so inspired by that message that when the offering came around, I dug into my pocket and put all that I had, that 50 cents, into the plate. I was inspired in thinking that God would bless me. When I left that day, I decided that I would make something of myself. Through giving, I have become the man that I am today, a millionaire 10 times over, and I want to thank this congregation for that. Well, the people, they stood up and applaud as the man returned to his seat. There was an older woman seated next to him. She acknowledged his testimony and then she leaned over smiling, saying, I dare you to do it again. Giving the first time all that he had was certainly inspired and irrational. But giving the second time would have been irrational except extravagant. This is part of what Paul is talking to us today about the hope of a rational extravagance. Hi, I'm Dick White, and this is the third study in a series of five-week church-wide Bible studies that will support those sermons that Mark and I will be preaching. We invite you to be a part of that journey with us. Today, we've reached the midpoint of our Hope Rises series. The first week, we looked at the hope that matters as we studied Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. We saw how biblical hope is practicing the promises of God. Last week, we looked at the hope of God-given supply as found in 2 Corinthians 9. We discovered that no matter how high hope rises, you can't out-hope or outgive God. And this morning we're going to talk about the hope of irrational extravagance, and we'll do so by returning once again to the Apostle Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. Our text for the day is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Once again, like last week, we are listening in on a conversation between a pastor and his people in Corinth. While there is a long and important history between Paul and this congregation, there is also a sense of conflict and confusion between them as they disagree on several fronts. One reason might be that Paul is making a direct, strong, and quite frankly, high-pressured appeal for financial generosity. There is a massive famine in Jerusalem, and the church there is in severe crisis. And Paul is asking the Corinthians to help feed the saints in Jerusalem. Basically, he expects them to double their grocery bill. And it's no wonder that there is both conflict and confusion in the church because this high expectation appeal needs a good reason and a good defense, which Paul offers in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul gives the church a testimony, a good example. A testimony doesn't make an argument for the truth, 
A testimony is a witness to the truth. In chapter 9, Paul gave a reasoned defense, but here Paul gives a personal witness. This is where our passage picks up. I'll be reading from today's New Revised Standard Version. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed into a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us. Paul has these little congregations on the southwest tip of Macedonia. They are handfuls of people meeting in one room, white framed country churches. Congregations, though small, giving in the name of Jesus, share more than what they can afford. And it is there that Paul finds the heart of Jesus-like generosity. Paul uses the amazing generosity of the Macedonian churches to instruct and inspire the Christians in Corinth. Let's dig deeper into the question of what does this passage mean by looking for those things that are odd or unfamiliar or are informational. I find it fascinating that in the same breath, Paul is describing the people of Macedonia as having both abundant joy and extreme poverty. To our ears, this sounds like an odd pairing. And when Paul opens the sentence by stating that the Macedonian churches are in a severe ordeal of affliction, it is quite remarkable. In a terrible season when the church is experiencing extreme poverty, these Christians are still holding on to their abundant joy that overflowed into a generous offering. This community didn't hoard the little means that they had. They didn't give just a little bit to make sure that Paul knew that they were being faithful to God's word. In fact, they gave from their means, and Paul says, even beyond their means. It is counterintuitive for our 21st century American culture. Society says that we should take care of ourselves first and if we have anything left over of money or time or you name it, then we can give. The Macedonian Christians have raised the bar and gave beyond their means out of their joy from a place of poverty in a time of affliction. This is a rational extravagance. And I wonder how the Corinthian Christians heard this message from their neighbors to the north. And I wonder how we, the churches today, can hear the message of the church that has gone before us. So what does this text say to you and me who are trying to be faithful today? First, the Macedonians teach us, like them, you and I are God's money managers. The Macedonians mastered the art of letting go of what was not theirs in the first place. No matter the level of their debts or assets, these churches learned to say, the package doesn't belong to us. Our job is to deliver it to the person or persons or causes that are in need of it. The first application that this passage lays upon my heart is just because God puts money in my hand, it doesn't mean that God intends for me to keep it. I am not the owner of my stuff. I am the manager 
of God's stuff. God has first claim over everything, and God has first say in where and how I direct the bounty and blessings that God has provided. This is why the Macedonians could be so extravagant and why I am called to be so as well. Because it's easy to be generous with stuff that doesn't belong to you. Second, the Macedonians teach us that perhaps the best time to give is when we are financially stressed. This sounds counterintuitive to us at best, or perhaps even manipulative at worst. But the Macedonians weren't giving away surplus funds because they had none. They gave out of their rock-bottom poverty. Literally, the Bible says, they turned their debts into riches. For them, faith was giving away everything to God, even their debts. Anyone can give when they have excess funds flowing, but it's when it's not the case, it requires a step of faith. Those are the moments when God says, I want to bless your life, but first, you'll have to trust me. The Macedonians' challenge to the church today is the excuses we use for not giving are the very excuses they use to give. According to Paul, this made all the difference. So how might we better pray and practice this passage this week? This is quite a challenging testimony that Paul lifts up to the Corinthian church. And we would be wrong to think that God intends this message to stop in Corinth. Paul says that the community in Macedonia was begging to be part of the ministry that God was doing in the world. What if we prayed that God would make us eager and excited for ministry? What if we prayed that God would help us understand what it might mean to us to give according to our means or better? What if we were irrationally generous in reflecting God's love in our church, in our schools, and in our community. How might this change us? At the beginning of this lesson, we heard the older woman lean over the pew and spoke to the businessman who had given his testimony, I dare you to do it again. Well, this is basically what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth that they should follow the Macedonian example. Now this morning we cheer for what the church has been in the past. We marvel how these Macedonian ancestors gave so sacrificially. And like the Corinthians, we are inspired by their story. We are also grateful that the church is no longer poor. And yet there sits Paul on the back pew of our minds leaning forward and saying, I dare you to do it again.